you all for joining us uh, this evening at our Sunday night Fifth Avenue Synagogue uh, programming uh, 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 schedule. We hope everyone is well, and uh, we continue to hope and pray that the cases in New York uh, decline, and please God, uh, around the country and around the world as well. Tonight we have a very special program. Uh, we're going to pay tribute to Rabbi Dr. Norman, Norman Lamb of blessed memory. Uh, tonight is his Shloshim, 30 days since uh, he departed. And whether directly or indirectly, Rabbi Lamb most de definitely uh, left his mark on American uh, Jewry. He helped uh, shape the character of Yeshiva University as Rosh Yeshiva, um, as president, as chancellor, and helped uh, direct its mission. And he guided the yeshiva through uh, some very, very difficult times. He was a Talmud Chacham, a uh, man rooted in Torah first and foremost, as well as a, a worldly man. And we're going to hear more about him from a Rabbi Dr. Michael Rosenzweig, the Fifth Avenue Synagogue scholar in residence who knew Rabbi Lamb well. And Rabbi Rosenzweig, we should realize that we had Rebbeton Rosenzweig uh, speak on Sunday night. We had Rabbi Eliach, your father-in-law, speak on uh, Sunday night, and now you're speaking. So we're making our way down the whole Rosenzweig why uh, clan uh, for this uh, program. So we, uh, we appreciate you spending the time uh, to, to uh, address us uh, tonight. Uh, to introduce, to formally introduce Rabbi Rosenzweig, we have uh, Dr. Barry Eichler, a former dean of Yeshiva College, the men's division of Yeshiva University, a highly distinguished and accomplished member of ours, man of uh, incredible character and, and wisdom and depth, and uh, uh, Please, I give your attention to uh, Dr. Eichler, who will formally introduce this evening's program. Thank you, <clears throat> Rabbi Babich. Uh, I also want to thank Jacob for the honor to introduce Rabbi Dr. Michael Rosenzweig, who will address us this evening on the occasion of the Shloshim Observance for the late Rabbi Norman Lamb, Zecher Tzadik Lebracha. Everyone in the Fifth Avenue synagogue community knows how much Rabbi Dr. Michael Rosenzweig, our beloved scholar in residence, has contributed to the intellectual and religious life of our synagogue, together with his dear wife, Dr. Smadar Eliach Rosenzweig. Having spent summers at Camp Massad, having received my BA from Yeshiva College, having studied at Ritz and uh, the Rebel Graduate School of Jewish Studies, and eventually, as you've heard from Rabbi Babich, my returning to my alma mater to teach and to serve as Dean of Yeshiva College. I've had the privilege of engaging with three generations of both Rabbi Rosenzweig's and Dr. Smadar Eliach Rosenzweig's families. These two beautiful families who have dedicated their lives to Jewish education uh, and to the betterment of the Jewish people so fittingly personify the proverbial statement in the biblical book of Mishle, Ateret Zekenim B'nei Vanim, Tiferet Banim Avotam, progeny of the crown of their elders and the glory of children is their forebearers. All of us who have studied Jewish legal texts with Rabbi Rosenzweig are aware of his mastery of Torah and the vast body of halachic literature which spans two millennia. But it is not only his vast erudition, his analytical prowess, and the clarity and precision of his presentation that captivates us. It is also his ability to distill from the technical, formal, juridic texts, sociological, philosophical, and theological conceptions which inform, transform, and elevate us. Rabbi Rosenzweig's pedagogical greatness is in his ability to turn a cold intellectual experience into a passionate confrontation with the divine text. This is the source of his infectious joy of learning Torah and which we gain as his students uh, and which Rabbi Rosenzweig instills in us for, and for which we are most grateful. Thank you for enabling us to truly experience the biblical verse Hashem's precepts are just, gladdening the heart. Hashem's commandment is radiant, making the eyes light up. 
We will now turn our attention to the main focus of the evening, the Shloshim observance in memory of the passing of Rabbi Norman Lamb Zatzal. It was Rabbi Lamb who most eloquently defined and championed the concept of Torah Umada. He did not understand the terms Torah Umada as Torah and human knowledge. In such a translation, the Vav or U serves as its most common function with the meaning and as a conjunction which joins together two separate terms, namely Torah on the one hand and Mada on the other. Rabbi Ram, <coughs> Lam rather understood the terms to connote Torah's relevancy to human knowledge. In such a translation, the Vav or U serves as the creator of a special relationship between the two terms, giving rise to a single concept. Think for a moment about the expression chesed ve'emet. This does not mean loving kindness and truth. Rather, it denotes a single concept translated as a true act of loving kindness, which is associated with a kindness to a deceased person, whereby the benefactor has no expectation of receiving a reward for his kindness from the deceased beneficiary. Thus, to Rabbi Lamb, Torah Umada was a singular concept defining the Torah's relevancy to human knowledge. And now it is my pleasure to call upon Rabbi Dr. Michael Rosenzweig, who will examine the legacy of Rabbi Norman Lamb Zatzal, a beloved rabbi, an esteemed Jewish educator, and an eminent communal leader who devoted his life to making Orthodox Judaism relevant to the modern world. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank uh, Rabbi Babich for, you know, Jacob Gold also for inviting me um, to address um, the community. Uh, I normally have that pleasure on uh, Tuesday nights. Um, we have a very special shear, which I have enjoyed uh, being involved with for already quite a few years and the relationships that have uh, developed there. Um, are very meaningful to me personally, and it's really, uh, again, a special uh, bond and a special framework uh, that we have cultivated. So, um, but uh, it's always um, an additional pleasure to participate in other activities of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue, which uh, I uh, am always happy to join. First, I want to thank Dr. Eichler for his very kind words. Uh, in the last couple of years, he's become um, a, uh, um, a participant in our Tuesday night cheer. And that's uh, for me, it's, uh, I think it's a great honor to have somebody of his, his learning, his scholarship um, in the group. And he has always uh, very fine insights as well. Um, the truth is that he and I shared a, a makom in the base medrash. <laughs> we weren't in the yeshiva studying at the same time, but when he was dean, you know, he would often, uh, you know, take my place in the base medrash for he came to early davening. I wasn't uh, quite as diligent as he was, but um, I think symbolically, you know, uh, when it first when he first sat in my makom and he asked me whether it was okay, I told him not only it was okay, but it was my pleasure. But uh, I think it really highlights the um, you know symbiotic cooperative uh, relationship um, that doesn't always exist in the different parts of the yeshiva or you know in larger extension between different. Uh, you know, branches, even of intellectual branches uh, of the Jewish world. But uh, it's something that we should uh, work to foster and to cultivate more uh, aggressively. Um, but in the case of uh, Dr. Eichler, it's a very natural um, relationship because he too is somebody who represents a combination, um, which I greatly respect, uh, the combination of uh, serious Jewish scholarship um, and somebody who is a true, authentic uh, Oved Hashem and a Yare Elohim and Tam uh, Chacham. And um, that combination is something which um, we need more of in our world. And uh, therefore, it's always a pleasure not only to have him on Tuesday nights, but I appreciate his kind and warm world words um, from the source uh, where they come. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on the Shloshim um, 
on Rabbi Lamb's Zechorna Lebracha's Shloshim, and especially to address um, the audience of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue uh, community, which I think um, was very deeply connected um, to his legacy, number one, uh, in Rabbanos, you know, uh, in Manhattan, the east side, the west side, but I think the entire Manhattan community has always been very, very connected, and I know that Rabbi Lamb was very beloved in the Fifth Avenue Synagogue, and especially, I think, the outsized role um, in terms of uh, economic support, but also moral support um, that the Fifth Avenue Synagogue community has historically provided, not only for Yeshiva University, but from my point of view, even more important um, for REITs, for Yeshivas uh, Rabbeinu Yitzhak Alchanan. I recall every year the, uh, at the REITs dinner, you know, um, seeing the overflowing, you know, Fifth Avenue synagogue uh, table. And uh, with some of the people who actually, some years later, you know, I got to know um, in the context of the Tuesday night sheer, some of whom are no longer with us, unfortunately, their, their memories and their inspiration continues on. Uh, and others who, who continue to be a, a part of the sheer and a part of the active uh, role of synagogue life. So I know that Rabbi Lamb had great affection for Fifth Avenue Synagogue and that it was reciprocal. Therefore, speaking tonight on the Shloshim um, a little bit in the time that we have uh, about his legacy and in, in his memory um, is particularly meaningful. Rabbi Lamb uh, Zacharna Levracha lived a rich and multifaceted life, one which was filled with personal, great personal and communal accomplishments. Um, his range of personal scholarship, um, both uh, timely contributions to contemporaneous um, issues, his expositions on matters um, that were important, you know, um, currently um, and were, you know, from the time that he was active, as well as his uh, scholarly contributions that were timeless, um, that related to the, the classical works and the classical themes and insights um, of Jewish uh, philosophy and halachic uh, philosophy, etc., as well as uh, his tremendous uh, 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 interest in, uh, passion for, uh, both uh, the world of Hasidus and uh, the Lithuanian, you know, rival counterpart world. It's it's fascinating. I'll, if I get a chance, I'll try to get back to that, that he wrote his PhD on um, the Torah Lishma of Rab Chaim Mivalajan, which of course is the paradigm of Lithuanian thought, um, maybe the, the most important articulation of it, uh, certainly before the Isha Alacha. And um, at the same time, spent um, you know decades and decades researching and ultimately producing a very fine volume on uh, the different schools of Hasidut, um, reflecting his range. Um, his involvement in you know community affairs and so on, um, all of these are are well known um, and need to be properly evaluated and assessed. But what I'd like to do this evening is to focus in the limited time that we have on the leadership role that he played in two crucial transitions that I believe transformed American orthodoxy, uh, Torah life in this, um, in this continent. The renaissance of Torah life in America that um, began, I think, in earnest, and I'm not a historian of American history, so I'm sure people could, might dispute the dates, but the general idea I think is correct. Uh, that began in the 50s, you know, and gathered more force uh, in the 60s and the 70s, and which already in the late 70s and early 80s, um, and has continued from there, um, to really constitute a remarkable um, transformation um, in terms of the prominence and the uh, content and substance um, of Orthodox life, let's say a renaissance uh, of Torah life um, in America. And in my opinion, he played an important role uh, in two aspects of these. The transformation of the Trefa Medina uh, of America um, that was dominated by deviationist uh, movements, deviationist movements um, in terms of religion, the reform movement and the conservative movement, um, reconstructionist movement, and so on, 
the obituary of halachic Judaism, of Torah Judaism, had pretty much uh, already uh, been written and uh, Torah life had been consigned, you know, uh, to fossil status uh, in many circles. If you just look at the, the literature, you know, of the 40s and the 50s and even the early 60s, um, just the way that orthodoxy uh, relative to other movements in Judaism were spoken of in the press, in magazines, Life magazine, Look magazine, Time magazine, of course, the New York Times, other papers, etc. cetera. Um, it was perfectly clear that um, orthodoxy had no future uh, in a modern uh, youth-oriented uh, dynamic uh, country like the United States. And I'm actually Canadian born, but what I'm saying about the United States is 100% uh, equally applicable um, to Canadian Jewry. Uh, the same exact trends, maybe a couple of years difference, but certainly the same phenomena. Um, and the remarkable um, change that has taken place, the efflorescence of Torah life um, in the United States and in Canada, um, again, with all the problems that remain, and they are formidable, enormous. Um, and I don't want to get into them this evening because we just don't have the time. But um, not none, nonetheless, notwithstanding, no one could have predicted um, that, you know, we would now live in a reality in which there are dozens and dozens of uh, yeshivot, some of them on very um, high and serious levels, um, that there are, you know, communities whose uh, commitment to Torah mitzvot and to Limerat Torah is, uh, is on a level that uh, never could have been even realistically dreamed of um, in the 50s and, and certainly in the early part of the 60s. Um, there are many factors that went into this transformation, or Hashem. It remains uh, remarkable. Um, but in my opinion, we'll discuss this more fully in a couple of minutes, um, the unsung hero um, of that change um, in American life, in communal life, um, the gener the engendering of all these institutions um, and the underpinning of serious limerat Torah and shmir samitzvos, um, which went along with them, um, some cases, you know, preceded, most cases followed. Um, all of this has much to do with an unsung group of uh, rabbis in the field um, and educators um, in their schools. I can give a fast shout out to. It was mentioned earlier that I'm following uh, in the path of uh, a Sunday night path, I guess, of uh, my wife and my father-in-law. But my father-in-law, of course, whose uh, contributions um, in Chinoch and pioneering um, enterprises like Tachnit Yud Gimel were really transformative in, uh, in our community and the larger Torah community. Um, but the, it's the combination of certain stellar, talented rabbis in the field, um, what I call the rabbi-doctor uh, contingent in particular, as well as some of those uh, visionary mechanchim um, both groups which refused simply to be realistic, um, both groups basically continued to dream or even more importantly, uh, continued to act out of conviction and idealism uh, with a sense of, of purpose, uncompromising purpose um, that generated um, the change that I speak of. But the second uh, part of this transition, equally important, um, and one in which uh, reads Yeshiva Sarbeni Yitzchol Hanan, and certainly other prominent yeshivot in America as well, uh, Lakewood and um, Chaim Berlin and Torah Vadas and, and so on and so forth. I don't want to leave anyone out. But the replication of a generation of European-born Russia yeshiva and Poskin who uh, grew up, you know, with a certain um, rock-solid uh, cultural, religious, um, axiomatic orientation, uh, the ability to replicate that on American soil and to do so without compromise, by which I do not mean that uh, we don't, uh, you know, uh, dearly miss um, the great um, pioneers of Torah in America from Europe, who I think were, even in retrospect, irreplaceable in the sense that they were singular and that without them, 
I don't think we could have achieved um, the transition, the transformation that I'm speaking of, but um, the ability to produce a uh, generation um, of uh, serious Tabari Chachamim, Poskim, uh, Rabbanim, um, on that level, um, side by side with the Renaissance and Torah and community life and so on and so forth, um, is something which uh, is a story that basically has not sufficiently been told. Uh, in my opinion, Rabbi Dr. Nachum Lam played a critical role in both of these um, revolutions. Rabbi Lam's role in these vital transformative um, endeavors was all the more significant for the fact uh, that he basically functioned um, in a dual role as both a key facilitator and notwithstanding the rigorous duties and responsibilities um, that he assumed uh, both in his rabbinical position, when he was a rabbi of the Jewish Center in particular, and he was very popular and very much in demand um, communally, and even more so when he assumed the presidency of uh, Yeshiva University and Yeshiva Sarbeni Yitzhak Al-Khanan, um, the fact that he was able not only to be a facilitator, but he continued to be a substantive contributor to these developments um, is something that is particularly uh, noteworthy. Let me introduce it by referring to um, a halachic uh, paradigm. In Parshas Balosko, we read of Aaron Akoin uh, being um, given the mitzvah, Balosko Saneros, um, being put in charge of the institution of the menorah in the Beis HaMikdash. And Chazal comment that um, initially, Aaron Cohen had a chalisha sadas. He was upset. Um, he had felt slighted. He and the Kohanim had been excluded from the Chanukah Samizbeach, uh, which the Nesim uh, were involved in, until the Rabboni Shalom assuaged his feelings of uh, neglect by telling him that uh, shalcha, that yours, is greater than theirs. And as some versions have it, Yours is a permanent, enduring contribution, um, which is more than the Chanukah Samizbeach of that particular era was going to be. Uh, what is the contribution of the menorah? The truth is that in um, Jewish thinking, the menorah is a paradigm for halachic thought, for Torah wisdom, and especially for Torah leadership. Uh, its singular ingredients, then, are a blueprint for Jewish leadership, scholarship, and impact. And that's why I want to make just a couple of uh, brief uh, references to them uh, in our short presentation this evening. It's rare, even atypical, uh, for one who is serving and demanding a leadership post to maintain his commitment to scholarly activity, to creativity, and to personal growth. It requires a passion for knowledge, uh, Torah specifically, that defines the core of one's personality. Um, and then no matter what your obligations, you simply don't have the ability, right, to give up uh, your own persona, which is defined by your commitment to Lima la Torah and to scholarship. But truly authentic halachic leaders are always defined by the sense of purpose and by the sense of passion which includes both of these components. Aaron Akoin's charge in the menorah, Bahaloscha, was to light the menorah, but this kindling of the menorah, certainly according to the Rambam, includes a complex interplay between being madlik and being native, between the infrastructure work necessary to sustain the institution of the menorah, cleaning it out, changing the wicks, making sure, as Alecha Mishnah points out, that the kindling won't become weak, but that it'll be continuously refreshed uh, so that it can be even more robust. What's fascinating is if you look at the uh, Rambam, for example, in his presentation of the mitzvah of Neros, in the Koteret, he explains that there's an obligation, lahadlok Neros Bechalyom, to kindle the lamps or the lights every day. But when he actually 
uh, analyzes the details of this halacha on Pergimel Halacha Yud of Hippos Klia Mikdash, he explains that Dishun HaMenorah, cleaning out the menorah, doing the maintenance work, Vatavos Neiroseha, and the infrastructure work that is an investment in kindling in a more qualitative way, Baboker Uba'ered Mitzasaseh, Shenemar Yaruch Oso Aron Ubanov. This seems to be a contradiction. The Hadlaka in the Koteret and in Minyan Mitzvos, and the Dishun and Hatava of the Halacha. But then the Ram goes on to say, the Hadlaka Sneros Dokhas Hashabbos, as if the Hadlaka and the Dishun and the Hatava are interchangeable. In Halacha Yud Beis, Mao Dishun Hamenora, and then he continues, Umadlik Ner Shekaba, the Hadlaka Saneros, Hi Hatabasa. And then in Halacha Yud Dalid, the Ketzad Madliko, and then he goes on to explain, Lohaya Metiv Kol Neros Bepamachas, Ner Shekaba Madlikin Oso Miner Acher, Ketzad Seder Haatava. In other words, the Ramam goes back and forth almost without any kind of explanation between the facilitation of and the enhancement of the Hadlaka and the Hadlaka itself. And indeed, in Jewish leadership, the ability to share with others and to facilitate structures and an infrastructure which creates dynamic, robust, long lasting light near um, is critical. But the only person who can facilitate effectively is someone who themselves is a modlik, understands and is committed and contributes to the substance. And in this sense, great Jewish leaders always have this combination, which is rare in the rest of the world. Rabbi Lamb is someone who had a very high profile demanding rabbinate in Manhattan. Um, and even more remarkably, um, under the enormous pressure uh, of running an institution, a complex institution, I can tell you, like Yeshiva University, is someone who continued to invest heavily in his own Talmud Torah, his own scholarship, um, addressing contemporary issues, and at the same time, never losing interest in the classical foundation that necessarily provides um, the foundation for a contemporary um, essay or exposition. Let me begin uh, by discussing the early years. Um, there is a personal element in my relationship with Rabbi Lamb, not so much. I mean, I worked with him for many years and Baruch Hashem, we had a good relationship. Um, we had many disagreements as people will and most uh, and many, many more agreements, but uh, Baruch Hashem, a very good working relationship. But my connection to Rabbi Lamb really goes back to his uh, very warm and enduring uh, friendship with my father, um, Shlita. Um, my father uh, came to New York um, from Toronto. He knew no one in the yeshiva, but he just had a um, very strong conviction, and that's a story in its own right, um, would stop, you know, would not stop until he made it happen that he was going to study in Yeshiva Sarbani Yitzchokhanan and Yeshiva College. And uh, one of the deepest friendships that he struck was with uh, the young uh, Norman Lamb. Uh, they were roommates for many years. Um, they were really um, a very um, warm friends. They developed a, a strong bond. And my father was alone in New York. And the Lamb family, uh, the extended family, who he had, who he developed great uh, affection for, Rabbi Lamb's uh, parents and his sisters and his brother. Um, often uh, provided him Achnasasarchim. He felt uh, a ben bias in their home. And it's a relationship that continued um, all the years, all the years, uh, even to the very end. My father was uh, in phone contact with, uh, you know, Rabbi Lamb, and that relationship, you know, continued to be a source of great um, strength and joy um, for both of them. It's something that extended, you know, to Rabbi Lamb's wife and my mother. Um, through them um, as well. Uh, but more than that, or side by side with that, uh, my father, together with Rabbi Lamb, were part of a, a group of chaverim that really developed a very strong bond and that shared um, a commitment um, 
and uh, a kind of mission, uh, conscious, articulated or otherwise, um, as Talmidim of the Rav Zatzal, to transform, uh, or at least to be consistent, um, to be principled. Uh, the result was that they transformed um, together with the great educators who were their counterparts, uh, all of them dreamers, all of them unsung heroes, they transformed Jewish life in America. Uh, the Rav Zatzal at the time was uh, able to handpick his shear. He had somewhere between, I don't know, 18 and 25 um, Talmidim. Uh, my father was in that group, uh, Rabbi Dr. Saul Roth, whose uh, attendance, you know, Tuesday night is also uh, a source of great joy and who's the Rabbi Emeritus, of course, of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue. And, uh, you know, uh, again, one of these accomplished Rabbi Doctors, Rabbi Dr. Moshe Tendler, uh, Rabbi Dr. Walter Wurzberger, who was at the Talmud in the yeshiva, but who became connected with the Rav and, and with that group. Uh, and others, I, I hope, uh, I don't want to mention them all because then I'll, I'll leave some of them out. Um, but this, this elite group um, were inspired by uh, the Rav Zatzal, his tenacity, um, his aspirational approach, ambitious approach to Jewish spirituality that is centered in the halacha and that is uncompromising, even as it is thoughtful and sophisticated and able to address contemporary issues and has the capacity to be appealing to a, a modern audience that gives it um, a fair um, hearing. Each of these rabbi doctors, each of these uh, special talented people who could have made um, incredibly successful careers and certainly more lucrative um, in any other um, you know, walk of life, including Rabbi Lamb and including all the others, um, were inspired to go into Chinuch and Rabbanos um, and to bring their singular kochos um, to this task. They were students of the Rav, and they were articulate ambassadors of Torah, sophisticated, each one with a nofech mishalo, each one with a different singular quality um, that helped them um, in this, uh, not intentionally coordinated, but as, again, students of, uh, of a great master who encouraged their independence and their cultivation of their own particular strengths uh, who encouraged them to go out, um, they knew enough to remain loyal to the goal and inspired by uh, the ultimate telos of all of this, but they became the ambassadors to Torah, um, which I think transformed the landscape um, of American Jewry. Rabbi Lamb in particular was very prominent in this role. His uh, capacity um, to speak, he was an excellent darshan, but um, not this clever drashos, the tochen, using style to convey um, substance, his eloquence, um, his effectiveness, both as a speaker, as a writer, as somebody who was accessible uh, and had content at the same time. A very difficult combination, um, I can tell you. A rare one and an important one. And uh, he became, in many respects, uh, one of the Rosh Hamadabrim for a sophisticated, unapologetic, um, um, idealistic uh, Torah Judaism fighting in the community of ideas for acceptance and winning that battle um, over time. Um, the Rav Tabidim, as I said, were independent um, and at the same time talented. Um, each had his own singular contribution to make, um, but in the end of the day, they perceived themselves um, as having a strong Masora from the Rebbe. Rabbi Lamb, in addition, had a strong Masora from his grandfather, Rabbi Baumel. I'll try to speak a little more about him as we go forward. Um, these were cultivated. They were packaged um, for each, and for Rabbi Lamb in particular, um, a very effective role that he played um, in, um, in, in leading uh, much um, of this um, revolution. Rabbi Lamb's writings, his lectures, his uh, persona uh, became very impactful. Um, as the first editor of Tradition, a journal 
which was devoted to um, tackling, I guess, contemporary issues, but again, in a very traditional way, uh, one that was intended to meld, again, sophistication and uh, modern um, sensibilities, but with the integrity um, of, you know, the continuation of the Masora. Um, it was symbolic and substantive that Rabbi Lamb was the first uh, editor of tradition um, in terms of what um, that reflected. So while the articles in Look and Life and Time were essentially prematurely um, predicting the oblivion of uh, Torah Judaism in America, um, these, this unsung group of rabbi doctors were in the field um, day after day, tzav l'tzav, kav l'kav, um, doing the work. And I don't mean as foot soldiers, they were, they were not foot soldiers, they were generals um, in a um, in an effort um, which uh, ended up um, having, you know, enormous impact. Uh, we are here and able to um, continue and to, you know, uh, accomplish um, and to take things to a next step um, because of that unsung group um, that whose dedication and whose talents um, brought us here. Um, let me move on since time is, uh, is, is already getting late. Um, let me talk about the second revolution uh, and Rabbi Lamb's role as president um, of Yeshiva University, which is obviously um, something that I am more personally um, familiar with. Uh, his obvious role in staving off the ec economic um, calamity for the Yeshiva, the rescue of the Yeshiva, is, uh, is something that is well known. I leave the details and the assessment to others who are much more competent in this field. But I do think and wanna emphasize that this includes a crucial mission uh, component that um, maybe is not sufficiently appreciated. Uh, Rabbi Lamb's heroic efforts um, to raise the funds and to stave off bankruptcy for the yeshiva um, this is something that he told me and others reflected a sense of profound personal identification and responsibility for this singular institution. Shiva University is the only institution of its kind in the world. Um, it's a complex place because of that. And it's also an indispensable institution um, because of that. And Rabbi Lamb identified fully with its ideology as wide ranging and sometimes uh, confusing, infuriating um, as that ideology can sometimes uh, be. I'll explain um, in just a minute. But he once explained uh, to me that he felt it would be Nachil Hashem unseemly that this institution that embodies this grand ideal would um, have to face the ignominy um, of bankruptcy. And I think that visceral sense of Akrayas, of responsibility, his love for the yeshiva and for yeshiva university, and his sense that he was entrusted with a legacy um, that needed to be carefully nurtured um, is something that he felt viscerally. Uh, it surfaced again and again in his stewardship of the institution. Any institution that tries you know, to combine and to integrate, you know, Torah and Mada, however you define it. Dr. Eichler uh, mentioned something of that in his Akdama. Um, obviously, um, you know, obviously opens one, exposes one to tensions that are, that are endemic um, to the very effort um, itself. And the institution, an institution like Yeshiva University is always pulled uh, in multiple um, directions. But that sense of a legacy trust is something that uh, Dr. Lamb, Rabbi Lamb, um, spoke of often. I heard him say, you know, the phrase, not on my watch, um, I wouldn't say ubiquitously, but frequently and interestingly in both directions, both when he was um, arguing the university's case um, against, not against, 
but when it was problematic or it came into problematic relationship with the yeshiva, and when the Russia yeshiva, one of whom uh, I count myself, you know, were pushing him um, to take, you know, positions and stands on complicated issues, but uh, not on my watch in terms of breaking up uh, the university uh, or undermining, you know, part of its MADA mission was something that we heard. And equally, to be fair, and I think this is uh, a tribute, uh, when the issue, when people made suggestions to dilute the yeshiva or to blur the lines between, uh, you know, certain aspects of uh, Velton, you know, Wissenschaft or, or, or Jewish scholarship and traditional Talmud Torah, the relationship between those also can become complex. Uh, the details um, are not for now. Uh, again, we heard Rabbi Lamb more than once say, not on my watch. He was very protective of Yeshiva Serveni Yotzko Hanan um, as a c- continuation, you know, of Yeshiva's Velazhin, um, as we like to say. Uh, so that the financial um, aspect really reflected a sense of deep identity and deep uh, responsibility. Less well appreciated is the fact that he presided over what I described earlier as the second central transition or crucial transition uh, that took place in American Torah life um, in this period. And that is the replication um, of Rosh Yeshiva, Poskin, first tier, hopefully, Tamide um, Chachamim, to, 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 to stand in the place of, we won't say replace, we'll say uh, to, to assume the positions that were sadly vacated by the great European um, predecessors um, who no longer could fill them. And uh, that is a very remarkable um, accomplishment um, as well. Quintessential American products who have the training and the temperament um, to continue, you know, the legacy, call it a Velazhin, of the Ola Matora, even as they are hopefully equipped um, to be effective on these shores in terms of their culture, their understanding of the community, um, etc. Many doubted that that could ever take place. In the beginning of Rabbi Lamb's tenure in Shiva University, certainly the majority of the Rosh Yeshiva um, and of the Poskim in our community continued to be the ones who came from Europe and who had been trained in the great uh, Yeshivot there, etc. Uh, And again, it was a particularly impossible challenge. I don't have much time, so I'm going to just, you know, uh, shortcut a little bit to navigate the inevitable departure of our great uh, Gadol Hadar, the Rav um, Zatzal, Zechot Tzadik Levracha, a colossus in all facets of Jewish scholarship, you know, in Lambdas and Jewish philosophy and as a personality whose imprint um, remains you know, to this day um, on the entire yeshiva and incalculable on our community and on the world community, you know, how to navigate, um, you know, when the Gadol Hadar, who, whose impact is so vast, becomes older, becomes weaker, he himself is not, no longer able or capable of, uh, of the commute, uh, etc. But together with uh, Rav Chalap, Shlita, the Menal of the yeshiva, whose role also deserves um, a tremendous amount of credit, not for now, but um, together they ably and deftly managed to cultivate and develop a cadre of Rosh Yeshiva and Ramim and Poskim in the community, together with what was going on in parallel in other yeshivot uh, and parts uh, of the Torah world. Um, What they were able to accomplish was to generate um, a group that were Talmidim of the Rav, faithful to his Mesorah in the way that uh, Rebbe Talmud Mesorahs are intended to be, not clones, but people who have their own combinations and nofech mishalahem and their own interests, etc., but who see the image of the Rebbe and um, have been, you know, certainly defined by the experience um, having been exposed to him. Uh, So to maintain continuity and coherence, while also breathing new life and dynamism and even creativity um, as appointment after appointment was made 
um, in the yeshiva. Uh, in the end of the day, um, this is exactly what being a mativ um, as well as a madlik is. Only by somebody who's a madlik can be a proper mativ, can, can, can handle and navigate the infrastructure um, in a proper way. But if the goal in the end is to make the transition and to come out with a more robust, not greater Talmidei uh, Chachamim necessarily, everybody, well, you know, every, no generation is, uh, you know, Alman um, Yisrael. Um, but of course, you don't replace, you never completely replace the great men um, who, who impacted and transformed, you know, your world. But the ability to um, move on um, to the next stage um, in a manner that respects that and it also advances the agenda of Torah um, is a, a very challenging, a very difficult enterprise and one which was accomplished in a way that wasn't suffocating to new um, creativity, but at the same time, again, which uh, guaranteed um, a legacy of Mitzvah. Uh, the role of the kolim in the yeshiva uh, was particularly crucial in this respect. My lamb is the one who um, established, in terms of fundraising and the parameters of what was then called the grus kolalelion, beyond a regular kolal, the idea of investing. I guess the original idea was like uh, patterned after, you know, a Princeton um, advanced institute where you'd bring together, you know, uh, elite group of Tamari uh, Chachamim, and you know, they would make presentations, they would critique each other, etc. It isn't exactly that way, but that was kind of the general idea. Uh, Rabbi Lamb was behind the establishment of the Gruskol. I was actually uh, personally, one, I think I believe I was the first one offered to be in the first uh, group of the Gruskol. I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to take those extra years of personal investment, um, etc. Um, and after the finances of that ran out, the replacement Wexner and Bearer, Baron Kolin, um, the Rosh Kol of the Baron Kolin, Rabbi Willig, Mordechai Willig is the Rosh Kol of the Wexner Kolin. Um, this uh, idea of having the opportunity to invest in young Tamidi Chachamim, to give them another three or four years where they can simply, um, you know, reflect and study and cultivate, you know, their own style, um, you know, in a, laboratory, you know, a desmedrish of like-minded, um, serious Tamid HaKhamim is something that has had incalculable impact on our larger community in terms of providing Rosh Yeshiva and Poskim and prominent Rabbanim. And of course, has had a transformative effect in the base medrash in our Yeshiva, um, the interactions, um, you know, with the younger group, um, I don't have time to elaborate, um, has been particularly um, significant. Um, together with Rabbi Chalap Shlita, Rabbi Lam was crucially involved not only in the fundraising but also in the design and the goals, some of which reflect his own priorities. Uh, the Wexner, for example, uh, Kolel uh, began to offer um, an advanced professional um, uh, structure to enhance uh, the ability of uh, 21st century uh, rabbis you know, to authentically, but also, and with sophistication, but also with effectiveness, uh, cater um, to their communities. And it became kind of a model program, which was then adopted by the rest of our um, smicha program. The Baron Kolel included a component which encouraged and funded um, further graduate schools, so that young Tamir Chachamim, who were getting these extra years of investment, you know, so that they could be steep in Havaya Stabaya Varava, you know, in, in learning Torah in a classical way, would also have the wherewithal and the encouragement uh, to pursue a Mada agenda, um, if you will. And Rabbi Lamb's own involvement with the Kolel um, is important as well. When the Wexner and Baron Kolim emerged, um, one of the new components was a program that several times a month had the Kolel Fellows meeting with Rabbi Lamb discussing community affairs or with some other um, speaker that he would preside over. Um, he forged the relationships with this uh, elite group because of that, but it also reflected his own priority in terms of continuing to be involved, not merely as a facilitator or an enabler, but as someone who 
you know, took a hands-on involvement um, as well. This same uh, sense of priority um, is reflected in his personal scholarship um, and his commitment to his own uh, continued um, output, literally uh, scholarly output, um, as I mentioned earlier. It's, it's astonishing to me um, what Rabbi Lamb was able to produce while in office. Uh, an extensive sefer on Chassidut, uh, tracing all the different schools, which was the culmination of uh, what he told me, decades of, uh, of consistent work. I once asked him about it and he basically, I told him I was very um, taken uh, with, with the book. And I also said, uh, I was being honest, that I was extremely impressed with the ability to do this given his schedule and his uh, um, obligations. And he basically told me that this is what, I wouldn't say kept him sane, but this is what gave his life meaning and therefore, la'at la'at, tzav la'tzav, kav la'kav, he continued with it. And uh, I found that to be a very remarkable um, posture to be able to not only feel that way, but to, uh, to implement that. Uh, Rabbi Lamb gave a year every year in the yard side of Rabbi Tzikohanan, again, in his own style, but with meticulous preparation and superb organization. Um, again, his own meld, which is different than mine, uh, of uh, halacha and hashkafa, uh, a sefer which, uh, as, I'm sorry, Shurim, that ultimately became a sefer called Halachot Vahalichot, which um, he mentioned uh, often, um, he wanted particularly to put out. He felt it was something that his grandfather, uh, Rav Yishua Balmo, who had a tremendous uh, inspirational and substantive impact on him growing up, uh, would have been proud of. But that mindset is something which um, I think is just very remarkable. Um, one year Rabbi Lamb called me in the summer and uh, the yeshiva was supposed to learn Gitin um, and made the suggestion that, you know, he might have time, you know, uh, every Wednesday, you know, to give a short shear in my shear. I didn't usually give shear on Wednesday. And um, he wanted to know whether that was you know, I felt that was appropriate. I thought it was an excellent idea. The yeshiva was learning Gittin. He particularly wanted to focus on a group of halachos, the Mishnayis and Gittin, fourth and fifth parrot, called Tikkun Olam. I guess you could call them social justice um, issues, which were up his uh, interests, very attuned to those topics. He wasn't able to do it every Wednesday, but again, even the aspiration, and he, he did give quite a few of those shirit, uh, reflected a certain priority of personal learning, um, an engagement with Torah, and his desire to teach, which given the schedule is quite remarkable. And this of course um, explains also his passion for the ideology. Rabbi Lamb was not a parva or a moderate Torah Mada uh, person. He felt it was a lechatchil ideology, as do I. Um, his uh, perspective was, and he elaborates this in the introduction to a book that he wrote called uh, Tarumada. Um, basically, uh, he writes in the beginning of the book that when he was a student, he became very um, enthusiastic, you know, almost captivated by this idea. But he was also struck about how little discussion there was about what it really meant and what its implications were, never mind how to execute and implement it. And that he felt the same way you know, when he came back to the yeshiva teaching, once he became president, he had resolved that, you know, when he had the opportunity, he would try to focus more on the implications of the motto. So it wasn't just a slogan in the elevator, you know, or on the uh, masthead. And um, what followed were, you know, uh, Torah Mata lectures and Torah Mata journal and uh, this book that he produced, but the involvement of uh, Rosh Yeshiva and professors of Judaic studies and other professors, um, again, at a certain point, you know, I think we all, including Rabbi Lamb, maybe a little later, felt that Kashem Shabakabun Schara La Drisha, Kach Makabun Schara La Drisha, you know, that you can, you have to, you know, had to, uh, 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 you know, had to move a little bit away from the, you know, the programmatic part of it at a certain point, but certainly it reflected his view that this was the Chatrila, his passion for it, his interest in ideas. The book that he wrote is an extremely, uh, interesting book. Um, uh, I don't agree with all of it. I, I like many parts of it, 
Um, I think he wrote it so that people would be challenged. Uh, it's a very eclectic, he has all sorts of different models of the Hasidic model, the Misnagdic model, the philosophical model, the sociological model, um, also reflecting a passion of Rabbi Lamb's. Uh, he wrote, uh, subsequently turned an article into a book called Shivim Panim, the idea of multiple truths, Rabbi Lamb was very respectful of a range of views that are legitimate, as am I. Uh, I think that is an important theme, Shivim Panim La Torah. And he felt that um, providing uh, that range um, was very important, even if that mean, meant being very eclectic, so that you can have some sort of a synergy between a Hasidic and a Misnagdic, or you can have a Hasidic a Torah Mada approach. But in terms of the enthusiasm and the substance and advancing um, the discussion, um, certainly the contribution um, is important. And uh, the sense of pride and L'Chathila um, is certainly um, very critical as well. Uh, Chazal say that the Kane HaMenora, you know, represent the reason that there are seven uh, branches is because there are different facets and dimensions of Torah. Uh, it's also important to know that they tilt towards the middle. And in this respect, Rabbi Lamb, I think, made another contribution. Um, he didn't like or was critical of the term modern Orthodox. He felt that it reflected um, compromise, um, that it sounded you know, like um, a watering down of standards. Um, and he believed, as do I, and the details of implementation between any two people on this topic are going to differ in some cases substantially, but that this has to be a lechatrila, an aspirational program, and one which is driven by and defined by and filtered by the Torah itself. I like to always uh, suggest that the Kanea menorah, the menorah, whose central nair, all the neiros are lit towards, tilted to the central one. The central one isn't a, a separate, you know, mobile nair. It's the um, stable Hefza Shel Menorah itself. Uh, Rabbi Lamb insisted on calling, you know, uh, what others called modern orthodoxy, which he felt, as I say, was too compromising or too relativist, a centrist orthodoxy. Uh, but not merely because it is in the center, or at least I'll tell you my take on it, but because my take now, but I think is what he agreed with, it, meant as well, because the center is the centrifugal force that keeps the Tzdade HaMenorah as part of the Mesorah as well. And that stability and that most of the, of the, of the foundational parts of the Torah come from the center. Um, and you have to understand, you know, the, the, um, um, the other expressions and manifestations you know, through the prism of the center. So I think that, uh, again, this uh, ideological perspective that he had is something which uh, as well um, highlighted his passion and his uh, interest in the substance. Um, an important um, aspect of this um, is the fact that he became um, um, successful um, and conveying to people, even with less background, um, this passion and this sense of um, authenticity um, and Masora. Um, I've always felt that his, uh, Rabbi Lamb's uh, superb um, fundraising abilities, of which again, i only an observer from a distance, um, even though he didn't have an obvious fundraising personality, Sure, he was urbane and he was charming, he had style and he had humor, uh, but other typical, more aggressive uh, characteristics that we associate with fundraising, um, he certainly didn't have. But I think that it was his gravitas as a serious scholar, as a Talmud Chacham, as somebody who, whose passion for the ideology, um, whose conviction, um, you know, for, and whose overriding identification with the institution his sense of uh, what I called before responsibility uh, as a trust and a legacy. Um, I think all of these shone through um, and garnered tremendous uh, respect um, and enthusiasm. Authenticity, sincerity, substance uh, were the crucial components, even in his um, success um, in fundraising alone. My, my time is up, but let me just end with one very quick story. 
Uh, this was told to me by, uh, you know, the former uh, dean of uh, Einstein, um, who was a non-Jew, and uh, who told me that every year there used to be a uh, Einstein dinner in uh, Palm Beach in, uh, in Florida. And that uh, one year, and Rabbi Lamb would attend, together with the supporters of uh, Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, he said that one year he was sitting at the hotel, this non-Jew, and he was eating his bacon and eggs uh, in the morning. And then Rabbi Lamb had just flown in from New York, and he was walking through the um, hall of the hotel. And this, uh, uh, you know, uh, very wonderful man who, who, did, who was the Dean of Einstein and a very refined person, he saw Dr. Lamb, he said, and he became hugely mortified um, that he was eating uh, bacon and eggs. And he went over to him and he apologized. At which point Rabbi Lamb, of course, very graciously told him that as a non-Jew, he has nothing to apologize for. Uh, he also added, uh, you know, humorously that if some of the Jewish donors had felt a little bit, uh, you know, mortified, that would have been, you know, perhaps better. But <laughs> the story was told to me to illustrate the respect that people had um, people didn't want to disappoint him. Uh, they felt that he was somebody who was authentic, who was consistent, who was sincere, um, who stood for something. Um, and they responded to him um, in that way um, as well. Chaval al Avdin, this is the Shloshim, a person of great quality and of great accomplishment, uh, to contribute to two related, of course, transitions, transformations, um, is a huge uh, legacy. It requires um, principle and uh, endurance, uh, wisdom, um, and sophistication um, to be successful in, uh, in, le in helping, you know, to accomplish uh, uh, almost an impossible revolution of, of Torah, of life in America, Jewish life in America, uh, whether it be, again, on the communal level, as uh, one of the rabbi doctors the unsung heroes, or presiding over and contributing to, both as a matev and a madlik, um, uh, providing for the next generation um, of uh, Rosh Yeshiva, Poskin, uh, Gedole Rabbanim, uh, other leaders. Um, these are our huge um, accomplishments. Uh, and that's quite separate from Again, as I say, the personal scholarship and the, the personal impact um, on many people. So, Tehenish Masaot Surah Ritzara Chaim, he will be greatly missed. And uh, the yeshiva continues and the Jewish community continues to benefit enormously um, from his legacy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Rosenzweig, for that uh, fascinating uh, presentation. That's an uh, insider perspective. Thank you, Dr. Eichler, for that uh, eloquent introduction of yours. We're now going to open up for any questions. Uh, you could uh, type in a question if you would like. We have a few questions to present to you, Rabbi Rosenzweig, if that's okay for you. With you. Um, the first question is that you mentioned that the Rabbi uh, Lamb spent a, a great amount of time developing the principles of Torah Mada, um, and he encouraged the Rosh Hashiva to get involved um, in developing those ideals as well. In your opinion, uh, the success of the yeshiva that he saw under his tenure, uh, to what degree did his efforts in developing this particular vision and this particular ideology uh, lead to the success um, that, he, uh, that he witnessed during his um, leadership of the yeshiva? Well, I will say that uh, by definition, and I think I alluded to this earlier, um, any hybrid ideology, Torah Mata, Torah, whatever you want to call it, Torah Derek Heretz, is, uh, is complex. Um, and difficult to define, um, even more difficult in some case to implement in a broad way. Um, and therefore, you know, it's much more challenge. It's obviously the challenge um, is greater than, a, you know, a more singular, singularly focused um, um, ideology. And by definition, it's not only more complex, but for that reason, it is also more wide ranging, meaning what uh, will actually constitute you know, uh, an application of this vision, you know, is uh, going to be debatable. Um, and I say Rabbi Lamb in his book, which is, you know, uh, I think a good barometer of it, um, talks about, uh, you know, 10 different uh, models of it um, that he's playing with or that he's, uh, you know, kind of presenting. 
Um, and he makes this point as well. Again, I don't think it's an original point. I think it's, a, it's endemic to the, uh, the enterprise. So uh, I think, you know, that uh, everybody has a different, you know, take on it. And I think that's perfectly fine. I think it, uh, personally, I would say that Rabbi Lamb now and then was a little bit frustrated. Um, he felt, I think, that some of the Torah portions of the yeshiva weren't fully invested uh, in the ideology as much as he would have wanted them to be. Uh, my view has always been, and I used to articulate this to Rabbi Lamb uh, very uh, regularly, I disagreed with him on that. Um, I felt, as I just said, that that's part of the process and that I think uh, we underestimate how much being exposed to a wider um, range, you know, um, and a more eclectic, you know, group of sources and, and so on. We underestimate how much impact that has, even among people who don't themselves um, formally or consciously, you know, identify with, um, with an ideology. So from my point of view, the yeshiva is a very dynamic place. Um, I think it's very healthy um, and it has a range, which I think it, it should have. So I think it has been very successful. I don't think, again, I think Rabbi Lamb spearheaded, he spearheaded a journal and he certainly raised consciousness about it. Um, the ideology existed before, it continues to exist after. And I think he was very passionate about it and, and contributed to um, its uh, further examination study and even in the substance. But I, I do think that has been very impactful, even on people who might deny it, frankly. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that one of his great contributions to the Shiva was uh, initiating a fundraising um, uh, uh, agenda that really saved the Shiva during a difficult time. Yeah. Are there any other uh, major decisions or um, that when the Shiva was in a crossroads that could have went in different directions that he uh, stepped involved and got involved in and made a strong um, contribution that the public may not uh, be aware of during the many years of his leadership um, of the yeshiva? Well, I'm sure there were many. Um, again, I, I did allude to the fact that uh, yeshiva university is a very complicated institution. Any institution that endeavors to accomplish what it aspires to um, is going to be complicated. It's going to be pulled in many different directions. Um, I, in my own personal involvement, I, I'm aware of many issues that came up that, in my opinion, could have been catastrophic um, if they had been handled in different ways. Um, I don't feel so much at the liberty to speak about the details of that, but in both, as I, as I said, you know, uh, I think I said in my presentation that Rabbi Lamb, I heard him say quite a few times, not on my watch, but as I say, in both directions, some of which I was happy about and some of which I was less happy about. Now, again, I, I think, you know, there's been much talk about, you know, the relationship between Dr. Lamb and the Russian yeshiva, and I'm not here to spill any secrets. It's not my nature. But what I will say is that, uh, of course, um, you know, when you're the president of an institution and it's a complex institution and there's a, you know, there's a university part and a yeshiva part, and even in the Jewish studies part, you know, you have different responsibility than if you're a Rosh Hashiva or the Rosh Hashiva, you know, exclusively. And each is uh, supposed to, um, from his perspective, fight for what he thinks is proper and right, especially in issues that sometimes are omade, you know, al uh, rumo shalolam, they're, they're very important. So I would say is that the relationship between Dr. Lamb and the Rosh Hashiva mostly was a very respectful one. Um, and I think he viewed us and we viewed him, you know, as part of the same group. And we also understood that he had, uh, you know, responsibility for the whole institution and saw things in a certain way as a result. And that we saw things in a different way because of our, our obligations. I don't think one was right and one was wrong. I understood them always in that way. I don't think there was any personal rancor ever. I think it's actually quite amazing how much affinity and, and um, you know, harmony there was, given how complicated things could be. But along the way, there certainly were many and are always many issues confronting a place like that, where if you do the wrong thing, you take the wrong stand, you know, you can destroy decades of careful um, stewardship. And, um, you know, a lot of disagreements about um, different things. But I would say in the whole, that this sense of, um, as I say, identification and responsibility uh, were very admirable, and mostly I think they they stood uh, Rabbi Lamb in very good stead. And um, you know the yeshiva, you know, came out of his tenure I think a much stronger place 
including the transitions that I mentioned. You can never be stronger for losing the Rav or David Lifshitz or, you know, et cetera, not stronger in personnel in that sense, but in terms of the overall structure of the yeshiva and what needed to happen and, you know, its, its ability to move forward and to develop and to cultivate for the next generation, as well as some of the other challenges. Um, I think that uh, with, all, <laughs> with all of the struggles um, that the yeshiva ended up in a stronger place. And, you know, we continue to have these uh, issues all the time. Sometimes you read about them in the newspaper. It continues to be a challenge. And we continue to have to exercise great responsibility for a singular institution. So, Thank you. Um, just, uh, two more questions and then we'll conclude. Um, you know, you mentioned that he was a very adept at uh, fundraising. Um, but to run a yeshiva, you need two things. You need uh, financial backing. And you need a Talmidim, you need students. And being that, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, uh, American Jewry was not necessarily so committed to orthodoxy and sending their, their children to these uh, schools, especially for university, when there are, you know, perhaps more exciting uh, options out there for a, a, a lesser affiliated family. Other than his uh, just genuine belief in the mission and his commitment to, uh, to, uh, to the Misora, uh, did he have, what made him successful to inspire so many communities and, and uh, to send their children uh, to the yeshiva and to trust him with their children, specifically, you know, in the college level, which is, you know, one of the most pivotal, uh, uh, um, you know, parts of a person's development and where they're going to end up in life? Well, I think the yeshiva already uh, always had a clientele and, um, you know, sometimes larger and sometimes um, smaller. Um, again, people know the numbers better than I do. I, I know mostly, I know from my father's time from stories and I know, you know, from when I came in the middle 70s, but there was already a pretty large, uh, you know, we would like it always to be larger, but uh, a good sized population. Um, what the yeshiva offers in terms of that combination, and I believe also, and I hope this is true, I certainly like to believe it, in terms of the quality of our base medrash alone, you know, um, is something that is attractive to serious people. And I think what did change in terms of uh, the background of your question is there was always a group that was interested and that was coming. Um, I think the Shiva became way more serious, uh, much more high level across the board. There was always the Rav and the Rav Shear, but that was kind of, you know, one story. Um, I think the real change there came from, um, you know, the year in Israel, which I, I alluded to my father-in-law, uh, in Shiva Flappish and Rabbi Simcha Teitelbaum in Shiva High School of Queen. And just the general, uh, they started the program called Tachtik Yud Gimel. Um, in addition, people started sending, you know, more, um, you know, routinely, you know, for a year in Israel and other circles. I think that, you know, had a huge impact in, um, uh, in, in establishing a much more serious you know, contingent and group of students coming back. And I don't think Rabbi Lamb had much to do with that. I think he was somebody who, you know, people respected and, and therefore they were happy to send there. And, you know, in terms of parents and, and other things. Um, so Rabbi Lamb had his detractors too. Anybody who takes positions and who espouses an ideology in an enthusiastic way will and did. Um, but I don't, think that he was the you know main recruiter or attractor of the students um, that let's say has to do with the ideology and especially with this transformation that took place but I think he together with Michalap were very wise in in managing it and in realizing that the yeshiva can't only be you know rav centric forever uh, and that the changes in Israel and learning in night seder I mean you can chart the change in, in yeshiva university through night seder essentially you know, my Vlachan Sin Zatzal used to tell me that, you know, in his day, they were like, uh, you know, they barely had a minion from Arav and you could, you know, roll things down the aisle and it wouldn't uh, bump into anyone. And by the time I was in the yeshiva in the 70s already, there was a very robust, that's what it began pretty much a year or two before that, a night seder. And that certainly is uh, attributed to the, um, to the Israel experience. Yeah. But, con you know, continuing that and then growing it, you know, smicha and post smicha, especially the kololim, um, I think... Um, all the people involved uh, deserve a lot of credit for it. And again, we, you know, we offer something very special and we need to always still do better. And we need to, um, you know, be um, attracting more students. I think it's important for, for Klal Yisrael. But, um, yeah, you know, it wasn't a one-man 
show. And as I say, it, uh, you know, in that sense, Robbie Lamb wasn't giving a regular share. That wasn't his, that wasn't his function and it wasn't his training, you know. So um, th there was a combination of different personalities and different factors. Before the last question, just to uh, um, mention a point about what you mentioned, uh, the yeshiva did give a year's credit uh, for studying in Israel, which is a big loss to the yeshiva in terms of uh, having students only on the campus for three years as opposed to four years and a loss of revenue. Um, right. that, and that decision really made it a lot easier for many uh, families to send their, their, their children to study for the, to Israel because, quote unquote, they didn't lose a year um, in their um, college by doing so. Was Rabbi Lam involved in, in that decision to grant the, a full year of 32 credits for studying in yeshiva in Israel? So, uh, as far as I'm aware, that already preceded him. Um, I think in Dr. Belkin's time. Again, I already had that when I came back. When I came back, Rabbi Lam wasn't yet the president. But again, he was always involved in, you know, those kind of tweakings, you know. Um, uh, for example, the, what, what I think he was involved, certainly, was in the issue of, I mean, on the one hand, we wanted to attract students to go, we wanted to people to go to Israel. It turned out to be an investment in Kal Yisrael and a good investment for the yeshiva as well. Usually, good investments in Kal Yisrael help everybody. As a Sanagav comment. Um, when people are too parochial, um, you know, I think only about their own interests ends up backfiring. But um, um, in the end of the day, it was very important for the yeshiva. And for many, many years, as a result, it was three years. People continued to learn in the yeshiva longer. We felt that was important because we felt that we had something unique in our base medrash to provide. Uh, smicha, smicha, even for people who weren't interested in going into the professional rabbinate, has always been a, a key dimension of our smicha program for people to learn longer. I'm very uh, enthusiastic proponent of that. Um, but at some years ago, um, there was also this, I, this concern that people weren't staying long enough, that we wanted to have more hashpa'a on who they are, their spiritual growth, um, et cetera. And the idea was to began to encourage people to do a fourth year uh, and to make it either financially feasible or in some cases, even like a scholarship year. Um, and, you know, so that the yeshiva might lose money, but that its influence, you know, in terms of the Kalal Yisrael part would be greater. And that I think is something that certainly was in uh, Rabbi Lamb's um, time, as well as, you know, other um, uh, initiatives, you know, to, and I'd say the Kolel Elyon and the, the, the um, growth of the regular Katz Kolel, uh, these things. Rabbi Lamb mentioned to me when we're talking about the Kolel Elyon, very wistfully that he, always um, felt, you know, uh, disappointed that he didn't have that option, you know, when he, you know, was uh, finishing smicha. My father said the same thing to me. They were in the same class. Um, and that, that door, which was very talented, just didn't have, you know, the opportunity in terms of investment, um, which, which is the difference, you know, sometimes um, in terms of achieving a certain level, et cetera. Um, so he was very sensitive to that, and he was interested in, um, you know, finding ways uh, through the kolel, through other things, you know, to advance the yeshiva's um, footprint. And in terms of the community service things, uh, I think he was very well. Again, it existed before him, but I think he had his own uh, imprimatur, uh, things like the Orthodox Forum, um, which he began, uh, or a way of kind of advancing the yeshiva's hashkafa. Uh, so there were many, many initiatives. Um, again, he didn't perceive himself, um, this is one of the most important things I've tried to convey in different ways, you know, as an administrator and certainly not as a fundraiser. Those were necessary to what he, as the president of the institution, was doing, but his heart um, continued, you know, to be focused on, uh, on Jewish life and on learning and on the ideology. And uh, I, I think that that's... Uh, how he perceived himself, and I think uh, rightfully so. The last uh, question, I'm gonna conclude with this. Um, there's no way you can know this answer, it's just a guess, a judgment, but um, based on your interactions with him as a person and his uh, visions, his ideals, you know, in theory, um, if he would have taken the Rosh Hashiva position and the present position in 2020, uh, today, based on the, the reality we live in now and the unique, uh, challenges and issues that exist now that didn't exist when he um, took the leadership position. Any idea you know, in which direction he would direct the yeshiva or where he would put his efforts in, in your 
just a guess, you know, um, from your years of interacting with them. I, I'm not a, I'm not a, a prognosticator. Uh, to me, though, I you know I'm always a little bit uh, um, not so enamored. I would say I'm not so enamored by those kind of questions. I think you always look for, you know, there there are challenges in every um, generation. As I said the challenges uh, that face the American Jewish community. To go back to my presentation, you know, um, in in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. We're, we're, we're much greater than they are today. Even I'm not uh, uh, discounting, you know, the formidable issues, whether it's, you know, the present, uh, you know, uh, virus uh, crisis, which will pass, uh, which obviously um, is challenging, or, you know, the um, question of uh, the standard of morality and, you know, and, uh, um, you know, what's happened to the, what's so-called Judeo-Christian, you know, ethic, which I think is a much bigger, bigger challenge uh, in society. These are very formidable challenges. In the end of the day, who you want to um, contend, you know, with these issues, always the same people. You want people who are grounded, you know, in integrity, you know, and in knowledge, um, who have wisdom, you know, and who have insight, and as I say, who particularly have a sense of um, the Sora, of legacy, even as they are flexible and creative. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you believe in, in, you know, uh, what we believe in, which are these values and, and Torah as a way of life. So um, in the end of the day, you're going to, you know, put forward your best effort, you know, to contend with whatever the issues of the day are, you know, um, through that prison. It doesn't mean that all such people will come to the same conclusions, although likely they won't be that far apart, likely, um, assuming that they're competent, you know, and that they really do have integrity. Part of integrity is also knowing what your limitations are and, you know, where you're expert and where you're not and when to ask and when to, you know, when to, you know, put forward a, a strong view. So I, in addition, not being a prognosticator, kind of the implication of the question, which seems to be that like each crisis, you know, requires different kind of fundamentally different kind of leadership is something which I find to be, um, you know, a peculiar, uh, not directing at you, but a peculiar kind of uh, assumption. Um, you would want the Rav and you'd want Rav Moshe Feinstein and Rav Shalom Zaman Orbach you know, in the round, you'd want the, you'd want whoever the, the great, uh, wise, responsible, whoever they are and whatever levels they are, you'd always want them, you know, to be there to address you. It might be Hashgacha that dictates, you know, who is and who isn't, because maybe sometimes, you know, the, the, the subtlety of the response uh, should be different. And I'm not suggesting all, that all leaders are the same, all decisions are the same, but you would always want competent, um, you know, very uh, principled people, you know, to be leading you no matter what. Okay, thank you so much, Rabbi Rosenzweig, for uh, the, mm -hmm. this tribute to, to Rabbi Lam. Um, please God, may his neshama have an aliyah, may mm -hmm. his family uh, be comforted. And uh, we want to thank you for everything you do for our community uh, throughout the, the year and the many years of the, your involvement. I think last time you mentioned it's the 20... Your, your involvement at Fifth Avenue Synagogue is up to 27, 23, how many years? Or? I don't know. I never can. Okay. <laughs> didn't hear it from me, but, okay. uh, it could be. but it's okay. gone by very quickly because it's been a pleasure. Okay. Thank you so much. And please, God, only uh, in the health and happiness and a lot of uh, an office from, from your family okay. to you and, and to everyone. Okay. Thank you all for joining us this uh, evening. And uh, we look forward to um, seeing everybody soon in person and in future programs online. Have a good night, everybody.